Well, why don't you turn in your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 1. We're going to get back into Romans 1. I do thank uh, Pastor Derek. He's not, he and Tanya are on, on the road uh, this week, uh, but Pastor Derek uh, filled in last week. I was able to watch that uh, message, I watched the, the whole service uh, yesterday, or Sunday afternoon. Uh, my family and I worshiped at another church. We, uh, we liked to do that just to give us a sense of when we're on vacation, give us a sense of what's going on in other churches uh, around the area. Uh, it also gives us a sense of uh, thankfulness for our own church. Uh, when we go and visit other churches, uh, we're, we're oftentimes very thankful for our own church and long to get back there. So it's a sanctifying experience when we go to other churches, but I, I watched the uh, service last Sunday in the afternoon, and uh, Pastor Derek did a great job. He, uh, he doesn't pull punches, uh, and uh, he tells it like it is, uh, so I'm, I'm thankful for him, and hopefully there, he and Tanya are uh, enjoying uh, some nice time away. But uh, we're going to uh, look at uh, verses 16 and 17 of Romans chapter 1. Now this is the thesis statement for the entire book. So we're going to spend a couple of weeks uh, here uh, on uh, verses 16 and 17. I'm not sure if we'll talk, uh, if we'll uh, preach on this next week at the uh, outdoor service. I have to uh, think through that uh, to see if uh, that's something we, we can and should do. Uh, I don't want to break up the flow of this, uh, and uh, being outside tends to do that. Um, so I'm just thinking through that, but um, we'll work through that this week. But for right now, we're going to look at uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. So Please follow along with me as we read these two very important verses. Paul says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let's uh, pray as we uh, begin our time in God's word this morning. Father, thank you for uh, <clears throat> bringing us together, and thank you for uh, your word. Lord, uh, enable us by your spirit of conviction, by your spirit of love and holiness, to submit ourselves to your word, that we would never position ourselves above your word or to the side of your word, but to... Be submissive to the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make us wise for salvation. Father, as we look at these two very important verses, I pray that uh, we would be clear, that uh, we would be wise, not in our own eyes, but wise with the wisdom from above, that we would fear the Lord and receive this food as you have prepared it for us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been ashamed of the gospel? Afraid to speak up at family gatherings or in social settings? Embarrassed by the gospel at times? Embarrassed to invite people to church because of the gospel content that has been proclaimed, thinking to yourself, well, I know I should speak to this situation, but maybe another time. Have you ever been ashamed of the gospel? I know I have. In fact, I have been ashamed of the gospel more times than I, have, than I can count. In fact, I have been ashamed of the gospel more times than I have not been ashamed of the gospel, if I'm being honest. One particular time that still haunts me today, which in fact God used to turn me toward his call to pastoral ministry and really to turn my heart back to himself, even though I was serving him in many ways. It was a time when God struck me with this conviction that I was ashamed of the gospel. It was 1997, and, and you have heard this story before. Uh, 
uh, I was working at an architectural firm and I was developing my career and uh, I was working with the owner of the company and he and I uh, had a special working relationship. Uh, for some reason, he would take me on his various jobs and, and I would be his sort of right hand man. Uh, but uh, this boss of mine uh, had been suffering from depression and it got to a point where he stopped coming into the office and there was about a three month period of time when this boss of mine was not coming into the office at all, at all. so his partner uh, instructed me to carry out his work, but don't let on that he wasn't in the office. So it was a bit of a, uh, an ethical dilemma going to job sites when they would ask where this architect was, and I would simply have to say, well, he's just not able to make it today. And in fact, he hadn't been in there for three months. Well, there came a time when he started to come back into the office and he started to return and it seemed like he was recovering from this depression. And it got to be the summer months when he and his wife would begin going up to their home in Nantucket. So uh, in one, uh, one point in mid-June, his wife, he and his wife were alone, they, they, uh, their kids were grown. His wife went up to Nantucket to open the family home, to open their vacation home. And this boss of mine was home alone for about two weeks. And uh, it, was about a, it was a Wednesday evening. It was the end of the work day. And he had decided to leave for the day. And I was still doing some work there. And while he was leaving, he and I had been making plans for the next day. We had a, <clears throat> some things that we needed to do. Uh, together on a, a couple of jobs, but we were joking that his wife was away and he was home alone, that he was a bit of a bachelor uh, at this time. Well, he went home and then I went home, but that evening I went to prayer meeting that Wednesday night. But while I was driving home, it was around nine o'clock at, at night, the Lord prompted me to drive to his house and to share the gospel with him. So as I was driving down the road, just rationalizing this uh, thinking to myself, well, you know, it's, it's after nine. Uh, he's probably uh, getting ready for bed. Um, it's late. He's probably not up for visitors. I'll catch up with him tomorrow. But the next day, that Thursday morning, he didn't show up for work. He had taken his own life. Um, and the sense of guilt from that moment that I felt for the next several weeks was really indescribable. Now, in my heart, I knew that I could not take responsibility for that. I felt as if I had failed the Lord, and if I had just gone and talked with him, he would still be alive. That's what I felt. Now, in reality, God is much bigger than that. And I could never have taken that responsibility on myself. But at least that, uh, that's what I had felt. In fact, I just could not get past Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 16 through 21. Where Ezekiel says that, you know, he's a watchman. And God says to Ezekiel, you know, if you tell them the truth and they walk away... They're going to be judged for their sin, but you won't take responsibility for that. But if you fail to tell them the truth, I'm going to put that to your account. So I couldn't get past that. I had to work on that. And ultimately, it led me out of architecture, which I had really been idolizing at that moment because I realized that I was probably following the same pattern that he was, uh, that, that he was following. But God forgave me of that and, of course, used that episode to... To move me out of a profession that I had idolized. But I often ask myself. And that was not the only time quite frankly. But I often ask myself. Why am I ashamed of the gospel? Well I can understand why I might be ashamed of the gospel. And why you might be ashamed of the gospel. Because it is weak and foolish to the natural human mind. It is something that is embarrassing to the natural human mind. It's something that does not make sense. And you would not naturally gravitate to that message of Jesus Christ as a way of solving life's issues. 
But let me encourage you, though. The gospel itself is the remedy for all of our shame. It is the remedy for all of our fearfulness. It is the remedy for all of our embarrassment, all of our weakness, all of our foolishness. Because the gospel is good news that brings us into Christ. So that if we are in Christ, God takes everything and makes it turn out for our good. See, our text today is its own key truth. We don't have to be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now you have to believe that because there are going to be times when you're just not going to speak and then you're going to be ashamed of yourself for not speaking. And yet we have the gospel that saves us and forgives us and makes everything good. It is the power of God to, for salvation to everyone who believes. Now, as we begin looking at these two verses, we're going to explore two dimensions. We're not going to exhaust these two verses. They're just so deep that one message can't exhaust two verses. But these two verses are, in fact, Paul's thesis statement for the entire book of Romans. Everything written in the book of Romans is either an explanation of these two verses or an application of these two verses. So we're going to spend the next couple of weeks wrestling with them. So let's take a look at our first observation. The gospel is the righteous will of God. It's the righteous will of God. Now, it says here in verse 17 that the gospel reveals God's righteousness. And we'll, uh, we'll explore that another time. But in short, righteousness is God's will, God's way of doing things. What God desires and how God acts. So the good news shows us the way that God operates. The how of God's uh, being. How he operates in this world. Now since it's God's power to save. The gospel then shows us how God saves. And of course in that salvation how God sanctifies us from faith for faith. That's what the gospel reveals. First of all we have to remember that God saves through weakness, producing strength. In God's righteousness, God has designed that weakness would bring forth strength. Now, this is the opposite of how we naturally think and, and act. We think that strength needs to be born out of strength. We need to be strong in order to produce more strength, whether it's physical strength or uh, intellectual strength or financial strength. Hey, you got to spend money to make money. See, if we are the strongest we can be, if we are the wealthiest we can be, if we are the smartest we can be, if we are those, then we can be successful. Now, this is the opposite of the gospel. Because God doesn't work through our strengths. He works through our weaknesses. Now, the idea that God needs our strength, it's a pagan philosophy. It's a secular philosophy known as pragmatism. Now, there's philosophical pragmatism out in our world doesn't matter how we get there as long as we get there. But do you realize that there can be Christian pragmatism in the church? And that's a cancer. That, that assumes that we need to be strong and that God will use these strengths to glorify himself and make us even stronger. Stronger. 
it also suggests that it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we get there to reach those goals. It manifests itself in a number of ways. Say to yourself, oh, well, you know, this, this curriculum, they don't really interpret the Bible correctly, but the kids really love it. See, that's pragmatism. Or, hey, this, this charitable organization, they have a Muslim on their board, but look at the great things they're doing for this community. That's pragmatism. And that's, that's drawn from this notion that says that it doesn't matter how we get there, we just build up our strengths and we will make it, we, we will be successful in those areas where we want to be successful. And that's anti gospel. Because the gospel revels in our weaknesses. It says, okay, well, we don't have a lot of resources to draw from. We're still going to preach the Bible. It says, well, you know, we are going to take a look at this curriculum. And we're going, if, even if we don't have any curriculum, we're going to uh, avoid going down the road of of this kind of pragmatic uh, dismissing the problematic areas of them and we're just going to be successful and have a lot of kids in our ministry and have a successful ministry. Church is going to grow. We're going to have dynamic things and it's just going to be wonderful. And yet the gospel turns that upside down. It says, wait a minute. Strength isn't produced from strength. Strength is produced from weakness. Saying, oh, well, we, we got to show that we, we know everything. We got to present ourselves as being the, the go-to guys. When according to the gospel, we have to recognize that we don't know it all. And there's some things that we're working on. But we're going to trust God and his word. And carry out the ministry as God has intended it to be carried out. See, as long as it works in our estimation, it must be good. But that's not weakness producing strength. That's a presumed strength producing strength. Doesn't matter how, how we get there as long as we reach our goal. And this idea says that poverty is bad. Well, poverty can be good, didn't God say, didn't Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit? But, but poverty is bad. We need to eliminate that. Well, what about what the Bible says? Well, it doesn't really matter what the Bible says. We have to have this priority. Or foolishness is bad. We can't look foolish to the world. If we do, we're going to lose all credibility to the world. We need to look like we are strong to the world. We need to look like we're powerful and intellectual and, and, uh, and, and wealthy. And we need to look successful to the world. But wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to be fools for Christ? Well, weakness is bad. We need to look stronger. We need to look better. We need to look like we have it all together. Because we don't think the alternative will get us where we need to go. Well, maybe that's the wrong direction to begin with. So, which means if we have this attitude that strength begets strength, then we're going to be embarrassed by anything that looks weak or foolish. And that's wrong. Listen to what Paul says uh, to the Corinthians <clears throat> when he says this, But he, that is Jesus, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. See, the Apostle Paul could be unashamed of the gospel because he knew and learned that God sees weakness 
as a good thing because it means that we are relying on him and it magnifies the power of God, not only among ourselves, but to the world. Those people, they're weird. They don't have it all together, but at least they trust their God. At least they believe what they say. See, weakness producing strength. It's one way that we can not be ashamed of the gospel. To simply recognize that God uses those weaknesses for his own good and glory. See, in God's righteousness, in his economy, strength doesn't come from strength. It comes from weakness. And what God considers strong is not what the natural man considers strong. Well, the righteousness of God, uh, God's righteous will is also foolishness producing wisdom. See, in the same way our definition of true strength is flipped upside down, our understanding of true wisdom is, always, is also backward. See, the world's wisdom is found in results. If something happens that I value, then it must have been the wise approach. But that's not what the Bible talks about. Because God's wisdom is found not in the results, but in the promises of the results. Now, certainly there are wonderful results, and the gospel does produce results. It produces fruit. But God isn't successful once he produces fruit. He's successful in his promises, knowing that fruit will be produced. But see, we don't consider ourselves successful until we see the fruit. See, that's foolish in the eyes of the world. See, you're nothing until you produce something. What about holding back and just learning and growing? What about planting and watering and cultivating and going years and years and years until you see that's what William Carey did. We talked about William Carey a few weeks ago. Missionary to India. Years before he saw his first convert. Does that mean he was unsuccessful until then? Of course not. He was laboring in the word. At our church in Harrisburg, we, we uh, supported a, a missionary. She was a young uh, single lady. She went to Italy. And she came back. Not year after year, but when her furloughs came, she would come back. Sometimes she would be crying because she never saw fruit being produced. There was no converts that she could put in her back pocket. Was she unsuccessful? Of course not. She was laboring in the word. She was doing what God called her to do. Finally, she came back rejoicing. Praise the Lord. Somebody came to faith in Christ in Italy. Through her ministry. Was that when she was successful? Of course not. But the world considers it foolish. For us to consider ourselves. Successful in the Lord. Without anything to show for it. But in God's economy. Foolishness. Produces wisdom. It's wise. To labor in the world. In the word. In the world. It's wise to do that, especially if we don't see visible fruit. Because it means we rely on the God, the, the God of the ages to produce the fruit. And we recognize that's not our role. God's word is first a promise based on God's inherent trustworthiness. Now, the natural man needs to see firsthand evidence of success before he or she will believe. So the idea of believing something before it appears physically is folly to us. But once again, Paul reminds the Corinthians this in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For the word of the cross, the gospel, is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. 
it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. See, preaching the gospel is so foolish in our world because we talk about a Christ we cannot see. We talk about a God whom we cannot see. We talk about a faith that we cannot see. We talk about heaven that we cannot see. And we talk, to, we talk about them as if they're the most natural thing in the world. How foolish to talk about something that my professor says isn't real. So silly. And yet this is the very thing that God commands us to do and to say. Believe something that you cannot see. Isn't that what Jesus said to Peter? Or to, to Thomas? When on the eighth day, Thomas said, hey, I'm not going to believe Jesus is resurrected until I see his wounds and put my hand in his side. So, okay, Thomas, kind of creepy, but here I am. Put your hands in my side. My Lord and my God. And he, what did he say? He said, you believe because you saw blessed are those who don't see, yet still believe. Also in 1 Corinthians, Paul says this in chapter 1, verse 27. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. In God's righteousness and according to the gospel, weakness gives birth to, to strength. Foolishness gives birth to God's wisdom. See, that foolishness gives birth to the very wisdom of God. And it also causes us, causes us to look very foolish in the eyes of the world. But guess what? We don't look foolish to God. So whose opinion matters more? See, we're going to look more and more foolish to the world. And we're going to be tempted to change the way we do things so that we look a little bit less foolish to the world. That's, a, that's an ongoing temptation. But we need to hold true to what God considers wise. See, why would we try to pay off our mortgage? We established a mortgage elimination fund. We're trying to pay the mortgage off in eight years. Why would we try to pay off our mortgage now in this economic climate of higher interest rates? where we could be investing that money and making even more money. Why, would, why wouldn't we do that? Because we're fools for Christ. And God's word says, the borrow is, borrower is slave to the lender. Is it okay for us to get ourselves, or, or to avoid getting out of that slavery just so that we can make some more money and look and maybe carpet the floors earlier, change out the chairs a little bit more quickly. See, it's foolishness in the eyes of the world, but that's the wisdom of God because it comes from God's word. See, during COVID, I don't know if you knew this or not, but we turned down free money from the government. Did you know that? We turned down free, free money. We had people wanting to give us PPP loans, forgivable loans. We could use that to pay uh, our high salary for our pastor. And, uh, you know, it would have been great. We could have had all kinds of money. And we would not have had to pay it back. But the world considers it foolish to avoid that. See, why would you turn down free money? It's free. Well, first of all, there is no such thing as a free lunch. It's not free money. It's paid for by somebody. So somebody's going to pay for it. And in the end, we're going to end up paying for it. But it's also not free because we end up giving something up in return. So when somebody says, hey, this is free, just take it. Just, just beware because they're, they are going to exact their pound of flesh. They are going to take something from you. You will eventually pay for it in some way, either philosophically or theologically or financially. They will exact payment somehow. 
But in the eyes of the world, hey, why wouldn't you take that money? But you know what the funny thing was? And somewhat ironic, during COVID when our attendance was like down to 45 people, we paid our bills. In fact, we were able to get ourselves in a better financial footing in the eyes of the bank. We were able to become more financially stable to such a point where we can now even say, hey, how about we pay off this mortgage in eight years? See, it's foolish in the eyes of the world, but in God's eyes, it is wise. Why? Because we're trusting him. We don't know where the next paycheck is going to come from. We don't know where money is going to come from. And yet, week after week after week, God works through you to fund these ministries, and we don't have to look to the unsaved to fund these ministries. See, that's foolish in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes, that's the way it's supposed to be. What the world considers foolish, God considers wise. Why? Because we are entrusting ourselves to a faithful creator who will sustain us to the end by his power and not our own. See, the gospel is the righteous will of God. Producing strength from weakness. Producing wisdom from foolishness. It's God's will. But, Paul says here, the gospel is also the powerful work of God. It's God doing something on our behalf and for his glory. See, when Jesus was doing his work of redemption on the cross, what did he ask? He asked the Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. What a powerful statement from the cross. It's a statement of forgiveness. And did you know that the power of God is the power of forgiveness? It's the power of forgiveness. It's the power of justification. It's the power of God looking at me and in all of my sinfulness and accounting me as righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. See, remember, verse 1 of Romans 1 said, this is the gospel of God. It's a gospel of forgiveness. It's a gospel of redemption. It's a gospel of justification. The first half, if not three quarters of this letter, is about justification by faith that ensures our eternal forgiveness. See, if you believe into Christ, you have an eternal guarantee of forgiveness. You are free from your sins. What did, John, what did Jesus say in John 8, 36? So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you have been redeemed, you have been freed. You are free from your sins. Of course, we don't want to be antinomian here. Antino, antinomian simply, antinomianism simply says that it's okay to sin because God guarantees our freedom, our freedom from sin. He guarantees our forgiveness. We don't want to do that. We don't want to slip into antinomianism because that only uh, devalues what Jesus has done on the cross. See, in, in our world, we have this perpetual problem that we would rather ask forgiveness than ask permission. Well, hey, I need something. No one's helping me. I need to get something done. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. And if Somebody calls me on it, I'll just ask them to forgive me. See, that's antinomianism. That's just plain wrong. It's not good. Because it says it's okay to sin. It's not okay to sin. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And that very reality says it's not okay to sin. So that, that philosophy that says, I'll just ask a forgiveness so that they don't have to ask permission. Not only is it antinomian, it's also pragmatism. It, it says, uh, I'll do this thing by any means possible, and it's okay as long as I get done what needs to be done. That's wrong. See, the problem with these ideas is that they erode trust, and they hinder the work over time. In fact, it impedes our own discipleship. 
Because that's not how God wants us to work. He wants us to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Not to do a side flank and go around the other people. Jesus uh, says, in his, uh, excuse me, John says in his first epistle, he says this, I, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So we don't claim that sin is okay. But in Christ, we know that if we do sin, we will always be forgiven because we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. So the power of God is a power of forgiveness. But it's also the power of deliverance. Look at verse 16 again with me. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Now we'll get into the Jew first and the Greek uh, second. We'll get into that a little bit later. But just know that the gospel is the power of deliverance. It's the power of God for salvation, for deliverance. To whom? To everyone who doesn't believe? No. To everyone who believes. The gospel is of no value to those who won't believe. It's foolishness to them. It's weak and despised. But to those who do believe, it's the power of deliverance. This is a spiritual deliverance. It's a spiritual deliverance now that is oftentimes invisible, but will produce the fruit of physical deliverance when we reach the end of our life's journey. Again, we talk in terms of invisible things. And the gospel is deliverance in the invisible realm now, but will become visible later. Well, what are some things that are invisible? Things that we're delivered from. We're delivered from the power of sin. That's invisible. That happens in the human heart. We're free from the power of self. We're free from the power of Satan. All in the invisible realm. Well, what will we be delivered from in the future? We will be delivered from the reality of sin. The reality of Satan. The reality of sickness even. That's God's power. And the world doesn't receive this because they can't see it. And they won't accept that there is a reality beyond that which we can see. We receive it because we see it through the eyes of faith. See, the gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. See, we don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. But even if we are... The gospel is still the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So let me ask you, do you believe? See, this is the truly great news. You are forgiven in Christ. I am forgiven in Christ. God relates to us through forgiving us. This is how the kindness of God is bestowed upon us. His kindness that is meant to lead us to repentance. Romans 2 verse 4. So that the thousands if not millions of times we sin. We can always come to him in repentance. And know that we will always be forgiven. John says in his first letter, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. That is, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even if we are unfaithful, he remains faithful. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 5 that now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased... Grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now we'll get to that in a bit of time, but we'll study that more when we get to it. But that doesn't mean that we intentionally sin so that we can receive more grace. Well, if that's the case, then let's go and sin more so that we can receive more grace. See, that's like the Iwana child in TNT who 
uh, knows that he's going to get candy every time he memorizes a verse, so he'll say more and more verses so that he can get more and more candy. That's somewhat rather selfish, isn't it? That's not the point of memorizing verses. But God promises abundant grace that is going to be super abundant over our sin. Grace that is greater than all my sin. But doesn't mean that we intentionally sin so that we can receive more grace. Because Paul makes this qualification in the next chapter, in, in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. He says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. Or I like the King James Version, God forbid. How can we who died to sin still live in it? But this does not diminish the precious truth that in Christ we are always forgiven. Well, what is our recourse when we're ashamed of the gospel? When you are walking down the road and you are prompted to share the gospel with that person. Say, ah, I just can't do that. And then you walk away. What is our recourse? Our response is to believe the gospel. Because in the gospel, we are forgiven. That's it? That seems rather silly. That seems rather foolish. Surely there's more to it than that. Well, belief presupposes repentance. Repentance is the turning from sin. Belief is the turning to God. It's, it's me saying, God, I am wrong. You're right. Isn't that what Abraham did in Genesis 15, verse 6, where God said, no, no. This servant is not going to be your heir. Your very own biological son is going to be your heir. And what did Abraham say? He said, in effect, well, God, I'm wrong. You're right. And we read in Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness. See, living a life of repentance and faith means constantly saying, God, I'm wrong. You're right. But in that... See, we're living out the gospel. And isn't that very freeing? That when we do sin, we have Jesus advocating for us. That he doesn't send us back into the darkness of our own sin. That he doesn't cut us off from life. It's one of the things that moved me away from Arminianism. Because I went to seminary. I thought I was an Arminian. As I grew up, my dad was strong Arminian. But I went to seminary and, I, and there was these Methodist pastors who would come in and they would plunk their books on the table and said, man, I, I lost my salvation today. And I thought they were joking, so I started laughing, but that offended them. They were serious, like, what? Really? That your salvation would be so fragile that if you sin one time that you're no longer saved? How? damaging that is to the cause of the gospel and to our own well-being. But repentance, turning from the sin, belief, turning to God, saying, God, one more time, I sinned, I'm wrong, you're right, please forgive me of those sins. See, we... we we develop that pattern by constantly looking into God's word and constantly seeing the righteousness of God so that whenever I am ashamed of the gospel, I must say, God, I'm wrong. You're right. Please forgive me. He came to my desk with a quivering lip, the teacher says. The lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I've spoiled this one. I took his sheet, all soiled and blotted, and gave him a new one, all unspotted. And into his tired heart I cried, do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new day for me, dear master? I've spoiled this one. He took my day, all soiled and blotted, and gave me a new one, all unspotted. And into my tired heart he cried, do better now my child. I write these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
This is the gospel. Do you believe this gospel? See, this is our sanctification. This is our spiritual growth and progress. We may think, oh, I'm always sinning. I'm not making any progress. But guess what? That's foolishness in the eyes of the world. It's wisdom to God because you are making spiritual progress because you are communing with God. This is our spiritual growth. It's our progress because it recognizes our own weakness, our own foolishness, our own sinfulness, and relies on the power of God. Are you ashamed of the gospel? If so, repent and believe the gospel. And you will be forgiven and cleansed by our loving, grace-filled Savior. And you know what he will say to you? Go and sin no more. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord Jesus Christ, precious Holy Spirit, we come to you knowing that at the end of the day, we are all just unprofitable servants. Father, we think that in our sin, we are never making any spiritual progress. But help us to believe the gospel, knowing that in your sight, we are being sanctified day by day, and that you have foreordained that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. Father, help us to believe the gospel. Help us not to be ashamed of the gospel, not only ashamed of speaking it to others, but also ashamed of speaking it to ourselves. Help us not to be ashamed, but Father, when we are, use that very message to draw us back to you, to repent of our sin and to receive that superabundant grace that you have already promised to us. We thank you, Father, for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Father, we thank you that by his wounds we have been healed. So we live, Lord, in the light of that healing. And we go out once again and serve you in an imperfect way, but we do so in the knowledge that you have received us, you will always receive us, and you will always forgive and cleanse us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.